When it comes to innovation, it's often not who did it first, but who did it best. Take for example the recent release of Tears of the Kingdom. Literally building on the successes of its predecessor Breath of the Wild, Nintendo introduced a mechanic called the Ultra Hand that allows Link to fuse disparate game objects together into sophisticated contraptions. Although it sounds complex, it's as intuitive as playing with Lego. Building a car, for example, is as simple as putting an engine and wheels on a chassis. Breath of the Wild already felt boundless thanks to its robust chemistry system, but the Ultra Hand raises the ceiling to near infinite potential. Quite rightly, many have praised Nintendo for this innovation, and it's likely that the feature will be replicated by imitators going forward. It feels so novel that one might ask where they'd even get such an idea. While I can't say for certain, Nintendo may have made like a great artist and stole the concept from their former colleagues. In 2008, Rare released Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts for the Xbox 360. Ten years after the first game of the series, the iconic Gen 64 duo finally returned to home consoles, satisfying fans demanding a new game since the turn of the millennium. Despite the tried and true 3D platformer formula of Banjo-Kazooie, Rare went out on a limb and produced something far more experimental than most were expecting. Nuts and Bolts fused a familiar, objective-driven adventure like those N64 originals with a sophisticated construction kit that allows for limitless problem solving. Like Tears of the Kingdom, previously expected activities like racing an NPC, ferrying an object safely, or even defeating a boss are given additional wrinkles by putting the player in charge of how they be completed. Innovation is driven by achieving the highest scores by completing activities either as fast or as efficiently as possible. Following in the footsteps of their previous Microsoft portfolio, this third console outing defied the expectation that Rare were merely Nintendo's right-hand men, as they tried an idea that Nintendo took 15 years to eventually try themselves. Fan response at the time was not kind, and critics were polarised by this creative outing. While The Legend of Zelda had almost 40 years of goodwill built up to welcome a game of this kind, Rare under Microsoft at this time had zero, and unfortunately, Nuts and Bolts would fail to find wide appeal. I've previously covered Rare's first Xbox release grabbed by the Ghoulies, a game that, once removed from the context of its creation, can be better appreciated for its quirks. Although I like Ghoulies, I wouldn't call it an easy recommendation and more of an acquired taste. Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts is a much easier game to champion, which I've done for the past 15 years. I even called it the best Rare game until Sea of Thieves stole its gold medal. However, Nuts and Bolts is still my favourite of the company's catalogue. Unfortunately, the game is trapped on Xbox consoles, an enormous shame because Nuts and Bolts deserves to find a more forgiving audience. A year before Zach Barth developed Infominer, the inspiration for Minecraft, Banjo had a creative sandpit that allowed players to easily and quickly produce creative wonders. But in the years and games that have passed since, Nuts and Bolts remains an awesome outlier that no developer has managed to replicate. Games like Trailmakers and Besiege allow a similar freedom of creation, and yet they miss a fundamental element that elevates this Banjo game to another level – a humanising motivation to build fabulous contraptions. Despite Tears of the Kingdom iterating on its thesis, Nintendo didn't do it first and they certainly didn't do it best. Nuts and Bolts has yet to be improved on. If you know anything about Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts is that the game was the bet noir of the Nintendo 64 generation. Released at a time where Super Mario had gone to the stars and simplified its objective-driven gameplay, and the 3D platformer seemed all but replaced by open world sandboxes, Banjo-Kazooie remained a nostalgic landmark. 2E in particular was the culmination of the collectathon genre, a grand adventure that had more in common with Morrowind than Mario where trinkets to grab and special moves were taken to maximalist extreme. Especially with Rare now under Microsoft, the allure of these N64 games grew brighter. Change is difficult to stomach, and so it's completely understandable that those who wanted Banjo Free did not want Nuts and Bolts. Making matters worse, Nuts and Bolts made an incredibly poor first impression. Initial teasers for the game kept its contraption-building gameplay under wraps, 
And the final game carries Rare's signature subversive humour that took great pleasure in skewering those who wanted a more traditional adventure, such as in its opening minutes. As a result, fence sitters who may have given the game a chance ultimately turned their back on the project. Meanwhile, Rare struggled to establish their identity on the Xbox. Although the 360 was initially that generation's PS2, appealing to a broad demographic of all age gamers, Rare found meager success with their brand new IPs like Viva Pinata. Banjo could have reversed their fortunes, but initial word of mouth deafened wide appeal. In the years since its release, opinion on Knots and Bolts has shifted as the context of its release grew smaller in the rearview mirror. The Rare Replay collection for Xbox One was many's first exposure to the title, and for those who grew up in a post-Minecraft world, Nuts and Bolts has a similar mixture of freeform sandbox creation and focus objectives. However, one criticism hard to shake is that Nuts and Bolts is not a Banjo-Kazooie game. While I could change the argument to say that Nuts and Bolts is great in spite of not being Banjo-Kazooie, that would be doing the title a huge disservice. Nuts and Bolts is physically built out of Banjo-Kazooie ephemera. It's not just that characters and concepts return, but it's in how they're reimagined. Nuts and Bolts' in-game soundtrack, played by the Prague Philharmonic Orchestra, blends familiar motifs from the entire series into new tracks, adding analogue texture to the previously digital, and evokes small hits of nostalgia without going for complete recreation. It's in audio what the game is mechanically and aesthetically achieving. Visually, the game worlds of Nuts and Bolts are physically stitched together from man-made materials, in a manner similar to the new Paper Mario games. For example, the first game world, Not Yakers, is meant to take place on a tropical island farm, yet its skies are glowing CRTs and its rolling green hills are patchwork quilts. A well-realised take on an intentionally fake environment. Meanwhile, the square look of the characters is as if blocky N64 figurines were made more robust in high definition, and their cubic look vibes with the cubic nature of the player's contraptions. On a gameplay level, certain gadgets available for contraptions evoke moves previously introduced in the series, like a turret that shoots eggs, or adaptable wings that allow slick transition between the land and sky, without the need for feathers and a launch pad. Perhaps the most blatant is the first special component unlocked in the main hub area, high grip wheels that allow traversal up one slippery slopes, just like the first ability in Banjo-Kazooie, the Talon Trot. Rare built nuts and bolts out of the remixed iconography of the Banjo games, but in an additional masterstroke gave players access to this ephemera to build contraptions. It's a great shorthand for players who know what these abilities achieved in previous games, but it also neatly anthropomorphizes machine parts for players who aren't engineering students. In short, Nuts and Bolts couldn't not be a Banjo-Kazooie game, because its main intent is to bring the series into the high definition era but Rare wanted to do more than just replicate the past. I get it though, these are purely surface level observations. Yet Nuts and Bolts is still a Banjo-Kazooie game because, unlike Mario at the time, it retains its original, objective-driven structure. Each game world of Nuts and Bolts has golden jiggies to be won, at the cost of doing a small job for its extended cast. Whilst treasures are no longer out in the open, found by reaching the highest peaks or strangest places, the game still evokes the challenge of its predecessors, activities like feeding an orange to a chimp or beating Boggy in a race, for example. Even a sense of eking out unseen treasures remains, with each level's Jinjo challenges and music notes to collect. The immediate benefit of this structure is that players can pick and choose which objectives they want to complete and when. This is good because as new contraption parts are unlocked, these challenges can be replayed to unlock better rewards and high score bragging rights. To encourage this, Nuts and Bolts introduces an anthropomorphized take on time trials. A smug cheater called Trophy Thomas is an embodiment of the high scores players could get, and ruining his day is a great motivation to hit them. <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom achieves a similar feat purely by the nature of being a Legend of Zelda game. Its contraption building is at the behest of solving side quests and shrine challenges, and although there is no additional motivation of getting a name on a high score table for completing these tasks quickly or neatly, extrinsic motivation is driven from the playground secret sharing that has kept Zelda relevant since the NES. 
Not some balls remains relevant 15 years after release because it retains its predecessor's objective-driven structure. Creation kit games have thrived since its release, especially now that physics systems are so much more robust, but what modern games often lack is focus. How many people bought Super Mario Maker hoping to be the next Miyamoto, only to be stuck staring at a blank screen unable to come up with anything? It's not that we're uncreative, but it's that directing that creativity is an enormous challenge. I should know a blank screen is the most terrifying part of writing a video because I have no idea what to initially put on it. One of the most successful creative toolkit games is Cabal Space Program because it has such a clear objective. You must get the Cabals to space by any means necessary. There is no one right way to get there, but because the goal is succinct, players immediately understand what they're meant to be doing. Nuts and Bolts has Kerbal's clarity applied to over 90 unique challenges. Sometimes you have to protect a statue from attackers, cook an egg, or beat your comrades in a race around a level. Even in challenges where the wrinkle of using a predefined build is thrown in, you're still allowed to break these solutions to your heart's content. Some challenges even encourage it by hiding secret contraption pieces on the objective path. The act of creating and editing builds in the game is slick and easy, subverting the kind of friction that breaks this kind of game. It takes mere seconds to restart a challenge, rebuild, and replay with a better solution. For those who struggle to start a build, the game gives players plenty of pre-made assets to fire the imagination. This pick-up-and-play approach to contraption building has made the game a treat I return to when I can. Similar to games like Breath of the Wild, I'm always excited to employ new ideas to solve old problems. Also like Breath of the Wild, I've got enjoyment sharing my strange delusions online to the amusement of others. Much like writing a video, Nuts and Bolts is a game I get better at with more real-world experience. In fact, this is my second attempt at producing a video on the game, and like my in-game contraptions, it's smaller and neater than my previous attempts. I always have room to improve, however, and there's a lot of other creatives out there that I can take inspiration from. Although popular consensus at the time was that Nuts and Bolts was a disappointment, a community of fans has slowly built up around the game. This downloadable content, Logs Lost Challenges, even pays homage to these dedicated builders by having fan contraptions take a starring role in its challenges. Beyond that, you can find countless tutorials online for overcoming tasks, demonstrations of players pushing Banjo's physics systems to comical limits, and even showcases of cool builds many have made over the years. My favourite channel covering this in particular is called Grim Grin, who literally sounds like a Rareware character come to life. And my videos are going to tell and show you how my vehicles work, so you can implement my knowledge into your own kick-ass vehicles. Like those months of great Breath of the Wild exploits and secrets being shared over Twitter, Nuts and Bolts had a much quieter scene taking place over the pre-HD era of YouTube, where this work has been immortalised in a low bitrate galleria. The Xbox 360 was initially sold on the promise of player-generated content, and ironically, the unpopular Nuts and Bolts was the game to properly fulfil it. I can only imagine what greater achievements could be made if Nuts and Bolts could make it to the Switch, PC, or wherever more receptive fans could be found. All this is great, but I left out one element that makes Nuts and Bolts one of my favourite games to return to. Rare are my favourite developers not just because they make games I like, but because I feel myself reflected in their work, and Showdown Town is a testament to that. It's one of my favourite hubs because of its look and tone. It builds up town that crams a seaside, Docklands, theatre district and uptown around a central market, populated by pigs, penguins and rhinos going about their daily business. It feels like a real place, and not just a glorified menu. Not only does Banjo return jigsaw pieces here, but they can even explore the grounds on foot, find vehicle parts, help out captured Jinjos, and as more special pieces are unlocked, explore to their heart's content. While the game worlds of Nuts and Bolts embrace artifice, Showdown Town is very much lived in, with crumbling architecture, unkept greens, and mossy stones. The visual markers all resonate with places I have lived, from boarded up beach houses, bingo halls, to stretches of nature. As a player fulfills more challenges, the town becomes more vibrant, as if Banjo's acts of kindness slowly bring it back to life. Rare's tone is often irreverent, but moments like this humanise the experience. 
even the game's cast of characters are given additional dimension as they embrace new creative opportunities. The best example is former henchman Klungo, who becomes a fully fledged indie game developer in this new environment, responsible for an auto scrolling platformer that beat Cannabalt to the punch by over a year. Like the builds Banjo and Kazooie are responsible for, Klungo's games are usually a little crummy, but have a lot of heart. It shows the heart that Rare love to put in their games, considering this arcade machine can be totally ignored, yet is there for players who want to fully engage with this brand new world. This is why Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts remains my favourite game by Rare, and why I wish it could be exposed to even more people. I have described the game as Gary's mod story mode to those that would best understand it. A creative toolkit with some direction so that builds serve a particular purpose. But that undersells the game, because the truth is that Nuts and Bolts succeeds by fusing a creative sandbox with the original charm of Banjo Kazooie. Toolkits often fail to convey the mechanics or goals, but Rare brings back a beloved cast in a humbling open world in order to make contraptions and challenges meaningful. Its game worlds and story might embrace the artificiality of being a video game, yet its non-playable characters have more in common with theatre actors. They commit to their identities and put on a show for you, the audience. It's the magic of what makes great games work. It's not just having the best mechanics, but the gestalt of how they are presented to a player. There's a reason fighting games aren't just square hitboxes, but instead a charming roster of appealing characters you want to root for. The same is true here. You're not just building cars for the sake of another token, but because you want to race against your pals. Tears of the Kingdom will go on to be another incredible release by a developer who continues to revolutionise video games every decade, and there will be many trying to crack the magic behind why it works so well. I wish innovators like Nuts and Bolts could be considered in those conversations. It wasn't the game Banjo Kazooie fans wanted on release, and in light of games like Ukulele and A Hat of Time, they may never be properly satiated. But many have never given it a chance, or don't even know it exists. And they could be missing out on their new favourite video game. It's one that, like Tears of the Kingdom, has an almost infinite ceiling for problem solving. But importantly, is all at the behest of making its little digital world a better place. Maybe you're watching this video and all the ways I approach these problems and are thinking that you could do a much better job. Used less pieces, made prettier vehicles, and gone about a solution in a completely different fashion. My response? Well, let's see what you can do.